Uh, I'm Bob Gary. I'm a professor of microbiology and immunology at Tulane University School of Medicine uh, here in New Orleans. So arguments around the origins of COVID-19 have kind of coalesced around two uh, competing arguments. One is that the virus um, uh, is the result of a lab leak, lab leak type scenario. Uh, the second one is that this is um, uh, another um, occurrence of a natural spillover event, um, a bat or animal um, a virus from animals um, getting into humans. Where do you sit um, on this? Well, I mean, really, there's no evidence at all for a lab leak. I mean, you have to really, uh, you know, go out of your way to, you know, consider the fact that maybe they had a virus at the Wuhan Institute of Virology that was, you know, similar to SARS-CoV-2. I mean, and very similar, like 99%, probably even closer than that. And that for some reason, they're just not telling us about it and that they were working on it. Undercover, maybe with the military, I mean, you have to put together a, a pretty large conspiracy theory involving some of the best scientists in the world. Um, on the other side, um, you know, the natural spillover, which is, you know, basically the way we've gotten, you know, all the major pandemics in the past. Um, you know, we have a lot of evidence for that. I mean, people on the lab leak side will say, well, there's nothing dispositive. There's no definitive evidence because we haven't found that one animal that, you know, had that 99.9% .9 virus and, and no direct transmission chains, but we have everything else. I mean, all the bits and pieces of SARS-CoV-2 are out there in natural viruses, including uh, this new uh, bat virus that was just um, sequenced and reported in a preprint uh, from uh, Laos and uh, a very similar virus to SARS-CoV-2. In fact, it's um, receptor binding domain, that, that part of the spike protein that binds to uh, the ACE2 receptor is very similar to that of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there's no way that somebody at the Wuhan Institute of Virology or any other lab anywhere in the world pieced that virus together and then just by chance came up with this receptor binding domain that we found just recently, or we, the virologists found just recently in this bat virus from Southeast Asia. My understanding is that one of them had only one or two amino acid changes uh, difference. Uh, it, it's very remarkable in the receptor binding domain. In fact, I was looking at it just this afternoon uh, at the spike protein uh, in the S2 subunit, which is the you know the part that does bind uh, to the receptor. Uh, there are only about twelve nucleotide, twelve amino acid changes, um, you know, in the whole of that S2 sub, S1 subunit. So that's a remarkably um, similar spike. I mean, it basically is a spike. Uh, I believe that it probably could spread easily from a, a lot of different animals to other animals, just like we've seen with uh, SARS-CoV-2. So in other words, if that virus wasn't even related to COVID-19, the virus that causes it, um, that one has the potential to be um, uh, potentially you know, quite destructive. It does. I mean, I think it, it, it clearly shows uh, the potential for spreading easily from animal to animal. And uh, that's exactly what we would expect of a pandemic virus. And it's in a bat in Laos. Um, you know, I mean, it's very close to SARS-CoV-2 overall. Um, maybe not quite as close as RATG13, um, but, but very similar uh, at both the nucleotide and amino acid level. So if we think about um, the receptor binding domain, um, and that is what obviously is important for the, the tropism of the virus and what species it may infect, does it, is there, would it be a helpful analogy to think of it as a lock and key type situation where um, the, uh, the key is um, on the um, receptor binding domain and it, and it fits quite perfectly the lock on, on the ACE2 receptor? Yes, absolutely. Something like that. These protein-protein interactions uh, are complicated, very specific, and uh, you know, a change here or there can actually increase or decrease the binding efficiency quite a bit. We've seen that with some of the variants of concern. Uh, but this receptor binding domain, only two amino acids different from SARS-CoV-2, uh, across a pretty broad stretch and an important stretch of the spike protein, uh, you know, that virus is poised and ready. Uh, to infect a lot of different species, just as we've seen with SARS-CoV-2.
Do you, I mean, obviously that they, uh, these researchers at the Pasteur Institute working with their colleagues in Laos, um, they, they went to four sites um, and we know in Laos, in Northern Laos, but we know that these bats, um, these you know, multiple species of bats inhabit a really large area. So are we only just scratching the surface in terms of sampling um, wildlife? Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that's significant about this new virus um, that was just described is, is that it's closer in this RBD than RETG13. So the WIB uh, didn't have the closest virus, at least in the receptor binding domain. If you're, you know, supposing that they were engineering or, you know, combining things together to make a new virus, they didn't have the virus that's the closest one. Uh, it's out the, it was out there in nature, and the, you know, the scientists from Institute Pasteur and their colleagues in Laos just found it. So that's you know pretty good evidence, in my opinion, against the lab leak and against any kind of bioengineering or passage in cell culture or passage in animals. That just didn't happen. You don't have to invoke that anymore because you've got this virus uh, with this very similar receptor binding domain. Do you think that there is some um, possibility that that um, virus or similar viruses that were found in Laos had actually spilled across into the human population, but didn't, un you know, fortunately didn't actually progress into causing an outbreak? Uh, most definitely that can happen. I mean, we know from a, a new paper from uh, the EcoHealth Alliance group and, and some mathematical calculations that they did, these spillovers are happening quite, quite frequently. And, and the, the issue is, is that, you know, a spillover has to have quite a few things uh, happen, you know, to make it turn into a pandemic. And it has to be, first of all, a very unusual virus, one that has this pantrobic or, you know, general type of capability to be able to spill over from one species to another. But it's got to get through a, a lot of other barriers, too. It has to go into the right population. I mean, say it goes into a very rural area where there are a lot of aren't a lot of people. I mean, it's very likely to burn out and not, you know, spread any further than that. And, and then, you know, get, just getting into a person and actually causing a disease, that, that's a pretty big barrier. I mean, you know, I mean, it, the viruses are clearly, you know, endemic in bats. There are quite a few of them we know. They're pretty well adapted to bats. And so, you know, it's not just the spike protein. It has to be some of the other proteins too that, that can do this kind of generalist thing and, and work in, in a bunch of different species. And so, you know, we know other viruses that can spill over and cause epidemics or pandemics, viruses like, uh, you know, Ebola virus, it has that same capability. It can infect a bunch of different species. It, it has the ability to bind to, you know, re receptors, you know, more or less efficiently for a human or a gorilla or, a, you know, a bat, all about the same. And, and that's what it's going to take. But it, it is a pretty specific set of circumstances. So, you know, viruses no doubt spill over all the time. Coronaviruses, paramyxoviruses, filoviruses, arenaviruses, these things are infecting people all the time. And we're just fortunate that, you know, those right set of circumstances don't develop that, um, you know, they, they spread, they become epidemics or pandemics. Now, what we can do, you know, we just don't have to sit on our hands. I mean, we can figure out what viruses are out there, you know, what have potential uh, to become pandemic viruses, find out what is out there, develop countermeasures, or at least develop ways to develop countermeasures measures quickly and efficiently. We need vaccines, we need diagnostics, we need therapeutics, things like monoclonal antibodies. All this technology is you know, at our fingertips. We just need to know how and where to apply it. And by doing field work like was done in this paper on the Laotian bat viruses, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make ourselves safer. Uh, it, rather than, you know, you know, sort of just waiting passively and waiting for that next spillover that actually does take off to occur. Do you think we also need some better qualitative data to understand what are the human behaviours that increase the risk of um, these zoonotic events? I mean, that certainly can hurt. And, and one of the things we could do are serological studies. And we need to do those in all places in the world where, where spillovers can occur. And that's, that's basically everywhere, but we know there are hot spots like Southeast Asia, uh, like in Africa, I mean, like in the Western United States even. I mean, yeah, we know that there have been multiple spillovers of different pathogens uh, even there. So we, we need to get a handle on those. We need to figure out what pathogens are out there. We need to figure out 
through serological assays, how many times they're spilling over into humans. If you can get a handle on that, you can probably figure, okay, that one is really poised for spillover. And if we look at the viruses and say, oh, hmm, you know, those are, um, you know, that's a potentially um, a dangerous virus. We need to need to deal with that or we might be dealing with it in the future. And those are the kind of things that we need to approach. I, I know our own NIH over here, um, Tony Fauci is, is working on developing, uh, you know, broadly reacted vaccines or at least places to get there. He's also uh, has some big initiatives to develop therapeutics and I'm hoping they're working on diagnostics as well because we need all three of those countermeasures to really be prepared. We, we can't let this happen again. We can't let, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic just reoccur again in, you know, COVID-23 or COVID-25 or COVID, even COVID-30. We, we need to be, be ready for it and be much better prepared the next time. Yeah, you just mentioned the RATG thirteen. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, from that was isolated from the uh, the cave of the mine shaft in Yunnan. Um, my understanding is that that particular sequence is about more than thirty years or more um, in sort of evolutionary distance from um, SARS-CoV two. Um, but uh, that the the isolate that was. Um, sequenced from, from Laos was maybe more like 12 years um, uh, closer uh, in evolutionary terms. I mean, I, I think some of those calculations are still ongoing and, and it depends on how you do the calculations. I mean, overall, RATG 13, uh, I believe is still a little bit closer overall, 96% similar to SARS-CoV-2, but in certain regions and in these critical regions, uh, this new Laotian bat virus is closer. And, and when you, you know, filter out things like recombination, which these coronaviruses do, yeah, I, I can believe it. I, I haven't seen the final analysis on this yet, but it wouldn't surprise me to find this virus from uh, this Laotian bat, uh, these bats are, are closer uh, in, you know, in, the, in the regions that count. So do you think we, we as a sort of uh, a species or at least of scientists, do you think scientists are moving closer to, um, to discovering the origins of COVID-19? We're getting closer all the time. This, this new data that's come out um, with, with this new virus, and there have been other viruses from Southeast Asia, from Cambodia, from Japan, from Thailand, that are all filling in the gaps in the evolution of the viruses. Basically, all the pieces are out there now, uh, and especially with this new Laotian bat virus with basically an identical um, receptor binding domain. Uh, we, we know that, you know, these coronaviruses recombine in nature all the time. It's just a matter of finding a virus that has put all the pieces together, spilled over to an animal, probably in the wildlife trade, uh, you know, a ferret you know, a ferret badger or a raccoon dog or a civet, something that, you know, can be infected by these um, SARS-like coronaviruses uh, and, and then piece that transmission chain, how it got to Wuhan, how, how it broke out in those multiple wet markets there in the city of Wuhan. I, I think it's interesting too, because obviously we've got the genetic kind of evidence and now there's, um, uh, where we definitely know that there's circumstantial evidence placing permissive animals um, in wet markets in Wuhan. Um, and, but even before that, we knew that there were SARS-like coronaviruses infecting animals, farm civets in Hubei province um, more than a decade earlier, as well as um, the presence of uh, SARS-related coronaviruses in um, rhinophilus bats in Hubei province. So yeah. we've also got, you know, these other elements of this of the natural origin story, you know, developing as well. Yeah, absolutely. That that's also uh, I won't say it's new evidence, but it's it's rediscovered evidence that you know there were civets in the in the farms uh, from Hubei pro province. That is very close to Wuhan, right? It's in you know and much closer than where the first SARS, the SARS one uh, outbreaks, and there were two outbreaks, two thousand two, two thousand three. Um, occurred. So, you know, thousands, a thousand kilometers away, uh, you know, ironically, you know, in the place where SARS-2 uh, broke out. So, you know, the fact that we, you know, know there are these infected civets, uh, SARS-related virus susceptible animal in these farms, uh, in the wild, there in Hubei pro pro province, I mean, it really changes the equation quite a bit, you know, because, you know, we know that now in the environment, we have these SARS-susceptible animals that 
you know, had a SARS virus, SARS-1, the original. Yeah. Um, do you think, um, sorry, I've just lost my uh, train of thought. <laughs> um, the, the cleavage, uh, the fear and cleavage um, side, that's obviously an important aspect of SARS-CoV-2 and its transmissibility. Um, do you, but we're, we're seeing evidence that, uh, that multiple coronaviruses in nature have pure and cleavage sites so that it's not a particularly oh, unusual thing. I mean, there, there are some people that have come out and said, you know, without really knowing the facts that, you know, beta coronaviruses, this, this one genus of coronaviruses, you know, they don't have pure and cleavage sites. That is clearly false. I mean, you know, people say that, you know, going to have to question, you know, wh where they're getting their information because, I mean, MERS is a beta, MERS coronavirus is a beta coronavirus. It has a pure and cleavage site. There's a virus called OC43, which is a seasonal coronavirus, it has a very nice pure and cleavage site. And there are a lot of uh, beta coronaviruses that have pure and cleavage sites. If you look at the pure and cleavage site of SARS-CoV-2, uh, it has several features that tell us that this is a naturally evolving uh, feature of this virus. Uh, first of all, uh, it differs from that RETG13 virus and now this Laotian bat virus uh, by 12 nucleotides at that cleavage site. Those 12 nucleotides are inserted out of frame. Now, I mean, that doesn't mean much, you know, if you're not following, you know, molecular biology very closely, but to a scientist, you know, you just got to say, look, nobody would do that. You know, nobody creating that or putting that in a laboratory would think to put that, uh, those 12 nucleotides in out of frame. Okay, and it's never been done. I mean, pure and cleavage sites have been inserted in viruses before, you know, retroviruses and, you know, follow by other things that have been done to, to examine the role of those, those sites before, but nobody's ever put one in out of frame. And there are just some other features of that, that site. Uh, you know, when you look at the evolution of the site, it's really a hot spot for evolution. These bat coronaviruses that we've been talking about, if you, you go and look through the ones like the Thai virus and the Japan, the Japanese coronavirus, all these, these close relatives to SARS-CoV-2, they are highly variable in, that, in this junction site, this, this where the furin cleavage site acts between the S1 and S2 subunits. It's a hot spot for evolution and no doubt in nature it evolved. Uh, maybe it's a later step in the process uh, towards becoming a pathogenic uh, virus for humans, but, you know, definitely um, you can put together that it, it evolved naturally. Given the similarity um, of the virus um, that was found in Laos uh, to SARS-CoV-2, does that, does that mean that the pandemic may have originated in Laos or do we need to, um, or does it just mean that we need to be doing a lot more sampling to sort of fill in the missing parts? You know, I think that that's probably too big a leap. I mean, you know, it's it's close. It's not, you know, it you you know, there these bats have pretty broad host ranges. So they'll fly all over Southeast Asia. They don't recognize a country barrier or anything like that. But you know, the point is, you know, we need to learn more about about these viruses and the bat species that that harbor them. And um, you know, going outside of China, sure, that that's a, that's an important thing to do. My take on the whole thing is so, so we need to also look at other species too. I mean, the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology was primarily looking at bats, uh, but we know even this new Laotian virus is not close enough to have been, you know, jumped over and, and caused this pandemic. It had, it probably had to go through another species of animals. And so what we need to be doing is looking at other uh, species of animals I'm talking about you know, animals like raccoon dogs and ferret badgers and civets and other animals that we know. A lot of animals are susceptible to these, to, you know, these SARS-related viruses. And then, you know, find that close one. Find the one that's 99.9 .9 similar. And then, you know, I'm going to bet that that's going to have been in the wildlife uh, chain somehow or other. And, and some, that's how it got to uh, the city of Wuhan. Yeah. Um, last question. Um, uh, do you think that there were... Uh, there are two lineages at the at the start, and that there may have been multiple spillovers um, that occurred. To yeah, I mean that's been discussed. There's a, there's a new excellent post uh, in 
uh, the website called virological.org where they address that, that possibility. Um, it certainly would explain a lot of things. I mean, we know about the famous lineages now, the lineage A and the lineage B. We know, you know, the B117, the you know, so-called UK variant, and, you know, the B1, B1617.2, you know, the Delta variant, those, those, kind of, those are, uh, you know, B lineage viruses, but there's also A lineage viruses. And what we know is, is that split took place very early uh, in Wuhan. Now, the question is, you know, did that split take place in animals or did that split take place in humans? We don't really have the answer to that. Um, you know, one, some people have, you know, looked at the genomes and said, okay, well, there's this, this uh, virus that, you know, has some of the changes in A and some of the changes in B, the so-called intermediates. And what this post in virology did was looked at those so-called intermediate viruses and say, hmm, they probably don't exist. They're, they're probably uh, sequencing errors or bioinformatic errors of some kind. And that actually those lineage A and lineage B, um, you know, viruses are, are distinct. Now, there are two possibilities for that. Either, either they, the split occurred in an animal or animals, and that probably occurred during the wildlife trade. That accounts for a lot of different things. Uh, or, you know, the split occurred, you know, early on in Wuhan uh, in humans. If it had occurred in humans, then it, it raises the puzzling question, why aren't we seeing real intermediates? You know, there was no reason to think that those intermediates would be any less infectious or any less likely to be passed from person to person. You know, how is it that we just haven't found any of those true intermediates yet? And, and that, that is the, the puzzling, perplexing thing. You know, it's a very important question. I mean, I think you can see other scientists that have, have weighed in on that. And, you know, it definitely raises the possibility that there were more than one spillover. And if, that, if there were more than one spillover from animals, that, that all but eliminates the lab leak hypotheses. Right. And so um, does, um, uh, which of the two lineages are still circulating? Both of them are both circulating, absolutely. Lunge B uh, got, you know, took off faster and, you know, spread, um, you know, more extensively around the world. But we're still seeing A lineage viruses. Um, you know, we see, saw them earlier in Wuhan. We, one of them came over to Washington State early on and, and then died out. Um, some of those A lineage viruses are circulating in Africa and other places around the world. So um, the split definitely occurred early. I mean, did it occur in animals? Did it occur in people? I mean, we probably never answer that question definitively, but uh, it's it's very important to you know sort of uh, think about it and try to uh, figure out what was going on there. And and more importantly, well, just as importantly, did it occur in Wuhan? Is that the only place where we've seen this evidence of a um, two lineages? Yeah, there's there's no evidence anywhere else in the world that there was early circulation of the virus. At least evidence that that most people believe, right? I mean, yeah, there there's you know talk about oh well, there was circulation in Italy or maybe there was circulation someplace else. I mean uh, that that's pretty tenuous, at least in my opinion. I mean, for what we can pretty much be assured of is, is that most of the early cases, all of them uh, happened there in Wuhan. And, you know, we haven't picked them all up. It'd be nice if we had more information about, you know, some of those early cases, uh, sequences, if they exist, uh, at least clinical epidemiological data, that would be very useful. And, and hopefully in, you know, the next phases of the investigation, China will kind of relent and, and, and turn over some of that information so we can learn more about what happened early on there in Wuhan.